everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be back in Iowa City. Welcome to all those uh, joining us from Zoom from all over the place. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dylan Molnar, who is visiting us from the University of Amsterdam as part of our ongoing uh, research collaboration with the Psychological Methods Group there. Dylan Molnar is an assistant professor, if I'm not mistaken, over there, he's the most popular statistic teacher of all times, as you will get to uh, experience in a couple of moments. A lot of his recent research has focused on his own science modeling, mainly because he got a very prestigious grant from Dutch government, and now he has to actually do what he promised and get the money. But that's what he will be talking about uh, to us today, within subject approaches to the analysis of responses and response times. And just like everybody at the University of Amsterdam, pretty much, he is uh, the recipient, or was the recipient of the 2013 Psychometric Society Dissertation Award. They do tend to collect them uh, at large. And, well, he publishes uh, quite widely on his own science, behavior, genetics, uh, intelligence. If I left something out, he will fill in the gap. But without much more ado, I'm giving the floor to Dylan for a uh, it's definitely going to be an teaching experience. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, so I'll be talking about response times. And I recently found out that, um, that, 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 that research into response times uh, starts by um, this guy, with this guy, Charles Darwin. It's like even something like evolutionary, the response time talk. And that's because um, uh, Charles Darwin's cousin, that's Francis Galton, he was very like, uh, intrigued by his ideas that Darwin had about evolution. And uh, Francis Galton really thought like, oh, this, this uh, uh, like response time is really an evolutionary thing. Like people that were like quicker or faster could, could like faster react to, 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 to input. Uh, yeah, they 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 uh, uh, had a yeah better better chance of survival. Yeah, so he was really inspired by Charles Darwin, and uh, so he started like doing a re response times. This was even before the intelligence test ex ex uh, yeah, was developed. Like he, he was very much concerned with like measuring the time you need to to react to like some kind of stimuli, and uh, of course he used like this is like. Like, like at the end of uh, uh, the like 1800s, like so, so, so 1900. And he was measuring response time with like this really, of course, old fashioned machinery, right? Like nowadays we have laptops, but he had like, like things with like, like turning wheels and buttons, and it was all very, uh, uh, yeah, mechanically, uh, it was a very mechanical device. It was, of course, very noisy as a result. These response times were very noisy, these measures. And uh, there was not like much statistics developed yet to analyze these response times. So he wanted to show that that, that people with like uh, with better jobs are, are quicker in these in his tests in these response time tests. But he couldn't he couldn't prove it. Like yeah, there were, were no no statistical methods. The the, the, the response time measures were so noisy. So uh, people were. Of course, really valuing his work, his other work, but they were like, okay, this was a bad idea. Like, this response time idea was a bad idea. And, um, and even, 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 even worse, like, uh, um, um, uh, the first um, um, intelligence test was also developed in that time that focused on correct, incorrect responses. So that, that was really like the end of the response time for in that time. People were really focusing on, on, on like these intelligence test items, the correct, incorrect question, and uh, response times was uh, were like dismissed for a really long time, up until like Spearman, uh, among others, uh, really uh, thought like, hey, there, there was something in this idea, and then later they showed that that, Fra that Francis Galton, his data is still around these data, uh, that he really had a point. So later, when the when the, when the statistical methods were better developed. Uh, and they could really like, uh, disentangle the noise from the signal in these response times. They really showed that, that, that his ideas, there was really something in it. Like, um, like these differences he tried to, uh, to show for people with different jobs, have different response times, average response time with higher job position, have uh, faster responses. 
uh, they, they really were able to show that. So, so he, he really had a point. Um, but yeah, yeah this, this is this is where, where my talk so also starts. Like it starts with Darwin, but of course I will be uh, um, yeah like talking about like 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 the methods that we that we, that we can nowadays use to analyze these response times. So I'll be focusing on intra-individual differences in this talk. So. Uh, modeling intra-individual differences in responses and response times. But of course I have to contrast it with uh, inter-individual differences. So if you, if you look into uh, inter-individual differences uh, of response times, people um, really want to add response times to their responses to, for instance, uh, improve the accuracy to uh, um, the, the accuracy of inter-individual differences. Yeah, so, so, so we, are, we have been focusing on these responses only, so the correct, incorrect uh, measure of like intelligence test items or educational test items. And people are really interested in, in, in adding these response times to increase like our measurement precision or to detect different solution strategies. So you can imagine that some people use different, a different strategy as compared to, the, uh, to other people. So this is a between subject thing and inter individual differences thing. And I always have this picture to make it clear if it's not clear yet. Uh, you have two persons, one person, and you have like 30 items, arithmetic items. And uh, you see person A is using memory retrieval on these items. So you have uh, three times four, this person uses memory retrieval, knows from memory, like three times four is 12. But uh, the other person uh, uses really logical reasoning. So this could be a child who doesn't know three by uh, four by heart, but really does like some a calculation and then comes up with the right answer, which will be like more error prone and uh, 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 less efficient. So this 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 person B will be the probability of an error will be will be larger, and this person will take longer. Yeah. So this is really uh, um, like an illustration of how response time are used to, to um, yeah, make, uh, make um, uh, differences, to draw differences, or, uh, differences between persons, so between persons. My interest is in intra-individual differences. Yeah, intra-individual uh, differences uh, in, for instance, solution strategies. So in the picture I just showed you, you can imagine that the person that's using memory retrieval, on, memory, memory retrieval on all these items uh, comes at item three, sees three times seven, and it's like, ah, oh, I don't know that one by heart. Like, I knew three times four from memory, but not three times seven. So then this person switches strategy and uses a different strategy on this item. So the logical reasoning uh, strategy in this example. Yeah, so this is my, 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 main, uh, my main focus of today's talk. So I will I will uh, um, present like statistical methods to um, yeah detect these kind of uh, intra-individual differences in response and response times. Yeah, so this is my outline. I have to start with like uh, where I want to start with the uh, models that are currently available for the inter-individual differences, and I'll then show how. Uh, like the opportunities that I see for extensions into to extend these intra-individual differences models into intra-individual differences models. Yeah, so that's um, like my extension. I will be focusing on a mixture approach. So a, uh, a mixture approach to detect intra-individual differences in response and response times. And um, what, I will, what I will tell about is like some problems that I encountered, and these have to do with distributional assumptions. So uh, these distribution, uh, distribution assumptions are very uh, important in mixture modeling. If you misspecify your distribution, you will find like like spurious mixtures, and uh, and this will yeah, this this mainly this is complicates this whole mixture approach. So I have like a couple of solutions, and uh, yeah, and then I will, uh, I will I will I will have some like like, like thoughts for further research. Yeah, but let me start with these inter-individual differences models. Um, like, the, like arguably, currently the most popular model, or the most dominant approach, is uh, a hierarchical approach, that they call it a hierarchical approach, in which you just model your responses, so the correct and incorrect, you model it by a standard measurement model from IRT. So it could be the three-parameter model, the two-parameter model, the rash model. If you use personality, I actually get to use the rated response model. 
which you have this model for the responses, and uh, you use a linear model on the uh, log response times for the response times. Yeah, so this is, um, when I first saw this model, I, I recognized it as a factor model, more or less. Like it's a linear factor model on the log response times. So the, 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 like the, the more traditional like factor uh, path diagram would look like this for this model. Yeah, so you have the, the responses here with an underlying latent variable theta here, and you have the log response times here with an underlying latent variable tau over uh, here in, this, in the way I'm presenting it here. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the traditional model that, that uh, uh, Wim van der Linde presented, um, this hierarchical model assumed the person parameters to be random, so um, by very uh, normal, and the item parameters as well, uh, 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 random effects. Yeah, so the, the person and the, item, uh, and, and the items are your random effects. Um, yeah, I simplified this model because I wanted um, yeah, to enable like 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 yeah, to, to enable like more like extension of these models, but also like um, uh, if you if you if you just drop these random effects from the model, this this is just a a factor model as I see it with with categorical indicators like a two factor model with categorical indicators and contingency indicators. Yeah, so this opens like many possibilities in the sense that uh, you can use all the machinery that's available in the factor analysis world, right? Like, 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 like fit initiates, uh, modification initiates, yeah, mixture extensions that I will talk about. Um, um, yeah, there, yeah, it opens up like a whole world of modeling possibilities. Yeah, but of course you can argue like, yeah, maybe you need the random effects in your model. Maybe you don't need them in your model. Like I've seen some reasons to have these random effects in your model, like some substantive reasons. Uh, but like from a pragmatic point of view, like I, I, I drop these random item effects in this talk. In my models, I don't use any random item effects. Um, but of course, I, I, I really want to acknowledge that there are there are circumstances where you really want them in your model, and in principle, that, that, that's certainly possible. Also in the models that I will be using. Yeah, so there are related models to this um, uh, like factor analysis uh, framework. So based on the Havarko model, um, you have the model by um, uh, by Tessa. Tessa. Um, in this model, you have like cross loadings. So from your uh, latent probability variable to your response times. In the, in, the, in the original model, there is a correlation between the random person effects. But here you model this correlation by means of a of cross logs, which is um, which is also possible. Yeah, then you have a model by uh, Maria Bolsinova and Jasper Dansa. So Maria is yeah, your close colleague, colleague of course. Um, they in their model they also use cross logs, but in a less restricted way than is done by uh, by Tissa. So if I go back to the model by Tissa, these um, these cross logs are constrained by this row parameter. Uh, while in Maria's model, they are all uh, estimated free, so which increases the uh, information that you that you uh, get out of the response times about the latent identity uh, variable. Yes, so this is even even it increases the accuracy even more uh, as compared to the initial models. Uh, then you have models that uh, that relax the assumption of conditional independence. So the original model is assuming conditional independence. So a conditional on the latent variables. You don't see any relations between the uh, response time and response times anymore, which could be relaxed in this way. And this is really an advantage also uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you look at this model as a factor model, introducing these residual correlations is very easy. Like you, it's just a uh, circulation modeling thing. You can just freely estimate the uh, residual correlations. Yeah, so straightforward extension if you're not happy with this conditional independence assumption. Um, okay, then my extensions to the intra-individual differences. Um, if you have intra-individual differences in your, uh, in your testing, for instance, so, so have my, my example of someone who switches strategies, you get intra-individual differences, um, which are not like uh, accounted for in a model. In a model like here, it's just a static model. So your 
for a given person, the speed and the ability of this person, so the theta and the tau parameter, are constant over the test. So you don't uh, speed up or slow down. Like that's, the, that's what the model assumes. So if people are speeding up or slowing down because they switch strategies, or they get tired, or they, they, they lack motivation, or their motivation increases, uh, all these within subject differences, all these intra-individual differences, will be observed in the residuals of the model, yeah, of, of this model. So what you can do is just use this intra-individual differences model and, um, and, and, and look at the residuals, so consult the residuals to make inferences about these within subject differences. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's um, where uh, a lot of work into detecting aberrant responses is based on. Just fit this model, so without the, so this model, just fit this model, calculate the residuals, and if people are speeding up and slowing down, you should, you should be able to see that from the residuals. That's one, that, that's a possible approach. I'm interested in like a more explicit modeling approach where you really have a model in which you incorporate these in, in fact, individual differences. Yeah, so what I propose is this dynamic mixture model. Yeah, where you add a latent class uh, variable to underlie each item. Yeah, so the, 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 the responses and the response times of each item. Um, so it's an item-specific latent class variable, and I'm assuming that this latent class variable has two classes. And I'll get to that uh, in the discussion, like whether this is like a good idea or not. Um, but for now, I'm assuming two classes, a, a, a fast class or a faster class, in which the responses are relatively fast, and a slower class, in which the responses are relatively slow. Um, yeah, so in this class underlies each item in this way. Um, so I have a measurement model for the responses now in each class. So I'm, I'm allowing these um, uh, item parameters, so the traditional uh, discrimination parameter and the traditional uh, item, I, uh, I consider an easiness parameter. I allow those to be different over these classes. Yeah, so that's why I have uh, a subscript uh, 0 and subscript 1. So for these two classes, I have separate discrimination parameters, separate easiness parameters. Yeah. For the latent classes, I specify a time homogeneous mixing proportion. So this, this, this uh, models the, the size of the class and the like each item. So um, this is the probability that a response comes from one of the two classes, which in principle like I'm, I'm not assuming a time homogeneous variant. You can, in principle, estimate this this proportion for each item separately. But of course, the model gets very complex. It gets more, uh, yeah, more and more complex. But you can later criticize this assumption. Maybe we should put other constraints in the model and leave this proportion. It's a very important thing to to to, to leave this proportion like unconstrained. I'm super happy to consider that. But for now, I'm constraining it. Uh, to be equal over items, and I have for the uh, for the response uh, for the response times, I also have two measurement models uh, within both classes that I um, I, uh, I I constrain uh, to some extent. So I have different residual variances within each class, or I can allow to have different residual variances within each class, and I have a um, a scalar uh, effect in, the, in, in one class, just to account for the uh, difference in response times over these classes, across these classes. Right? Because, as I said, like, I have assumed two classes, and one is the faster class, one is the slower class. So I really, uh, I, I really do that by, by using this delta parameter. Okay, so this delta parameter is a positive parameter, which ensures uh, I fixed it to zero in class zero, and in, in class one, I'm estimating this parameter, which ensures that this class one is the faster class. So this is this is this is the first um, like dynamic model that I'm considering, and I have one more extension, and that is a uh, I wanna like as the model is now, these class variables are independent. So if you are independent of each other. 
So if you're in class one on one item, it, that, the model assumes that it doesn't tell me anything about the class you will be uh, in, in the next item, which maybe sometimes is a reasonable assumption, sometimes not. So what I uh, wanted to do, what I really wanted to do was to uh, drop this assumption and specify a mark of structure uh, across classes, over these classes. Yeah, so that I can predict you are in, uh, if you're in item two, you're in class one, that I can predict uh, the, 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 the class membership on the next item. Yeah, where at least I, 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 I can uh, see whether this is the case or not. So I will fit across multiple models and see whether this Markov structure really improves model fit, whether there's really, uh, it's sensible to, to have it in my model. Yeah, so um, this brings me with like a, a transition probability and an initial state probability. Yeah, so um, I, I here have the, the probability of being in a state on item one, and then I model the subsequent probabilities. I uh, all model with this um, transition pro uh, transition, yeah, yeah. Maybe these transition probabilities. Yeah. So, and again, it's a kind of homogeneous Markov uh, model, um, meaning that this transition probability is the same for each item. So, for each transition, this probability is the same. Which, of course, you can you can you can challenge because I think maybe we need like. Uh, yeah, different transition probabilities over time, and uh, that is also possible in principle. But yeah, again, the model gets very complex. You need a lot of data to uh, to, to to accomplish this. Yeah. So um, okay, I, the only thing is that I need a baseline model as well to compare uh, my models to. So this independent model with the independent classes and my Markov model. Um, and the, the, yeah, the baseline is just this hierarchical model as I was starting up with. Yeah, so this is just a static model, um, and um, uh, I want to uh, yeah, compare these dynamic models to this uh, baseline model to see whether they uh, make it make sense or whether they uh, account for the other. Yeah, so uh, model estimation is like by marginal maximum likelihood. So this is the likelihood function. Um, uh, the, the model has been implemented in latent gold. So you can, um, yeah, so, so it's relatively uh, relatively easy to, 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 uh, to, to, to apply the model. You can, uh, it's relatively easy to extend it, for instance, to, to, to relax this assumption of time homogeneity uh, to add around just to constrain parameters. Uh, it's, it's, it's relatively flexible. Um, it uses, in it, it, it uses the baum walsh adopted EM algorithm, because you can imagine that with all these, that you have as many summations as you have items, because you have one layered class for each item. But there's a, there's a clever trick to, uh, to evaluate this expression, because you don't have, because like if you, um, uh, if you don't don't consider this Bach uh, algorithm, you have to uh, evaluate every combination of these summation uh, sign. So, um, but there's a clever trick in which you can evaluate this like relatively um, relatively fast. And I I don't show here the, the the results, but I did a simulation study where in which I at least convinced myself. That, um, yeah, that, 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 that the model is feasible. So I said, uh, parameter recovery was acceptable. The fit niches that I consider, so the BIC, the AIC3, and the sample size suggested BIC, they all work like acceptable. So they, they, they pick out the right model and they don't have like uh, too many false positives or whatsoever. Yeah, so a, a, I, have, I have a couple of applications. This is the first one. Just this, this model as a representative here um, uh, to a knowledge test, which is some kind of intelligence test, and it, it was administered at uh, a couple of psych psychology freshmen. Um, here you see like, the different models that I consider. So I have my static model, I have the dynamic model where the, the class are independent, I have the dynamic model where the, uh, the classes show I have a mark of architecture to a mark of structure. And, and then within this dynamical Markov model, I constrain the discriminations to be equal across classes, or the easiness parameters to be equal across classes. 
And what you see is that this is the best fitting model. So a model with a dynamic market structure, uh, easiness parameters that differ across classes, but discrimination parameters that are equal across classes. Yeah, so if I look within this model, here you see the, uh, the difficult, of, so sorry, so this, this should say the easiness parameters. You see that this is the slower, the blue line is the slower uh, class, and so you see how these classes differ in terms of this easiness parameter. It's not really, um, yeah, mind blowing or something, but you see like some systematic differences. Uh, what I like more is like these, um, these uh, posterior class membership estimates. So for each subject, I can consider the posterior class membership of, in this case, the fla fast class. So this is the fast class probability. And here you see a person that really like, slows down. And uh, the interesting thing is that in a raw log response time, you don't see this effect because it seems that the person, oh, now yeah, you do see it, sorry, of course, the person is slowing down, but it's, it's less clear here. Yeah, and here you have another um, example where you, for instance, see that the, that, that the person is really slowing down for item 16. Well, in the raw response times, it, it's not really a, uh, yeah, item 16 doesn't stand out or something. Yeah, so, so here you see, uh, but of course, a, a raw log response don't account for like, differences between items in like primary density, for instance. Some items, they really take longer because you have to read the text or they really take longer. And this is all in this, uh, in this log response function. Here it's, it's accounted for. Um, there are more examples here again. I think yeah, item 14 is very interesting. Uh, here it doesn't stand out and here it's, it stands out a bit. Although I now see that I should have maybe put the axis until zero. I don't want to trick you guys. <laughs> Some people do this to trick people, right? And this is just, I, I, I only now know this. Um, and here again, like I just have minutes over here. But this is just to illustrate, like, these, these posterior class membership. Okay, and I get to the challenge because the model that I just presented assumes this, uh, this, this log normal distribution within each class. Yeah, so I take a lot of the response times and I, I assume that these are normal. So the, 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 uh, the, the intervals from response are log normally distributed. Um, while, like these are two famous data sets, like this is, this is a, I can really argue that this is a famous data set, it's the chess data set by Hans um, Maas, and that's in response time research that that data set is used so much, like because yeah, a lot of people have so much fun with it, like they can you know, test their models on it, and uh, it's really a really nice data set, but just an example item, you see here, these are the log response times of this, uh, in this data set. And you see that they are not normal because of truncation. And this is another data set, which is uh, a block design test, so it's an intelligence test. And here you see that there's not necessarily like truncation, maybe a bit of a floor effect, but my point is more that it's, it's skewed. It's, it's not normal, right? It's, it's, it's skewed. So, um, yeah, if it doesn't matter, like there's a misclassification, right? If I, if I apply my models on data like this, but it doesn't matter, then I don't care. But what will happen if you uh, apply these models, these mixture models, assuming a log normal distribution within each class, you'll get this. So what I did in this, this is a simulation study, just to illustrate the pro problem. Uh, what I did is that I simulated data um, according to the baseline model. Yeah, so no dynamical, no <laughs> dynamics in the data. It's just a static model, just a baseline model, just a two-factor model for the response and response time. So nothing is going on. People are not switching strategies whatsoever. Um, and I, and I use that log normal uh, distribution for the response times. Now what you see is the, um, this is, these are the false positive rates, but these are all zero. So my, the BIC, AIC, all these fitting niches correctly point to the baseline model uh, in these data, in the log normal baseline. It, it, sorry, I see there, according to the log normal baseline, and the fitting niches all say to me, like, oh, the, uh, the baseline model is the, the, the right model of the three models, right? Baseline, uh, independent uh, dynamic model, and the market dynamic model. 
Um, however, if I truncate my data, you'll see like false positives of one. And the same with the skewed baseline. So I just have a baseline model, but the, 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 the log response times are skewed, so not normal. And then you will uh, like draw the conclusion that there are some dynamics going on in the data. So you will find mixtures, experience mixtures. So I was not happy with it, of course. Um, and you can also tell from the parameters, these are the parameters, they're all, uh, so these are the parameters in the case that there is uh, dynamics going on in the data, so I simulated the data according to a, a Markov mixture model, and what I, uh, in this case, I truncated the data, or here I, 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 I transformed the data into a skewed uh, data set. Um, in, in the normal case, you correctly find your, your parameters. But in the truncated case, you get bias. In the skewed uh, case, you also get a bias. Yeah, so wrong model in the case of the baseline model. You have experienced mixtures. But when there, are, when there are mixtures, you get like a biased um, a picture of the whole situation that's going on. Um, so I have three solutions where, of which like these two are very much the same, solution one. And solution one. Um, it's a very easy, a very pragmatic solution, but it's simply to categorize the response times. Yeah, so what I do is I just categorize the response times and not use a linear factor model for the response times, but a graded response model or a partial graded model. Now what you see is the same, same situation, same simulation study, but then with this categorized response times and a, a graded response model for the response times. And you see that all the false positives uh, are gone. Yeah, and the parameter bias, this is in the case of seven categories, I use seven categories here, and you see that uh, for the truncated case and the skewed case, like the, 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 the bias, like I don't want to say disappeared, but uh, it's more or less disappeared, like I, I can't see any systematic uh, differences anymore between like the, the true values, which, which if, if, if there are um, Correctly recovered, they should all be on this uh, on this on this straight line. Yeah, so very pragmatic um, solution, and uh, of course you should do this with care because you might uh, yeah, influence the power to detect an effect with using different uh, cutoffs to, to to cut your response time distribution into pieces, but um, it does work. So how does the model change? So this was the model for continuous response times with these log, log normal, uh, so the log transformed response times over here. Um, how does it change? You categorize these and you fit some kind of um, model for yeah, categorical data. So like, so rating response model or a partial pattern model. Yeah, so that depends a bit on how you choose the link function. Um, yeah, so that, that's solution one. I have, an, I, have, I have an application of this model too. And this is a logical reasoning test. Um, I used seven like percentiles. And um, yeah, let's look at the, at the results. So these are the model fit results. So it's the same uh, idea again. So I fit like multiple models. And I look at the, um, uh, I look at the VIC. And I see, I, I use two, um, two schemes to categorize the response time. So either like based on the percentiles, I think it's here. So either use uh, percentiles or seven equally spaced intervals. And you see that both like uh, both approaches like give me the, 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 the same model. So again, it's the Markov dependent states uh, model. So uh, dynamic mixture model with a Markov structure. And the discriminations are similar uh, over states. So are equal over states. Yeah, so um, and these are the, this, this is the initial state probability. You see, you see that the faster class is a bit larger. And here you see the transition probabilities. So what you see is that people tend to slow down a bit. So they go to the slower class during the, um, um, uh, during the end of the test. Uh, these are, again, the, um, the, 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 the item easiness parameter estimates over classes. And I have these posterior um, class membership estimates again. 
And what you see here is that this person is very fluctuating. This person is very slow. And here you see a person that is around the 0.5 uh, probability of a, of a slow response. And this is like, yeah, what's going on here is that for this person, there are many, this is some kind of like personal misfit. And for this person, the model doesn't make sense. Or, or the other response that don't contain any, anything uh, um, yeah, about this fast, slow, uh, yeah, about these fast, slow classes. Yeah, so this, I would, yeah, you, you cannot do anything with this, for this person. Yeah, so the, the model, yeah, this person misfit. The model doesn't make sense for this person. So there's maybe only one class for this person, or maybe there are four classes for this person. And then I have another, I have a couple more examples. Um, this person is speeding up, slowing down. You can you know, really tell from this posterior class manager. And then solution one B, it's still the, uh, it's just another model, but it still relies on the, um, on the categorized response times. And what is in this model, I um, model over dispersion. Yeah, so you can imagine that uh, that there is differences in these response times. Uh, in the continuous response times, in terms of like, the residual variance, so the variance of response times. And then I didn't account for that like, in the initial model. And you can imagine that, 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 that there is a difference like that, so that there is uh, yeah, interstitialicity. Yeah, so that the, the, the variance here is larger or smaller than in this class in the response times. And you can account for this by this dispersion uh, parameter. And um, uh, in this application, I illustrate this model. So we have the, the, this block design um, test that I showed earlier. I showed this distribution that was like skewed, um, skewed distribution of response time, of the log response times. I use five categories now, and um, these are the results. So I get the baseline model, uh, and what I uh, fit is a heteroscedastic Markov stage model where I allow this dispersion parameter to be different across classes. And here I constrain this parameter to be equal over classes. And that, uh, that's the homoscedastic Markov stage model. I have also an heteroscedastic independent stage model where I drop the Markov structure and a homoscedastic independent stage model. And you see that for this example, the heteroscedastic Markov stage model is the best fitting model. So I'll look a bit closer to these um, parameter estimates. Here you see the um, initial uh, state probability, which is uh, 0.6. See the transition uh, matrix, which indicates that the, the classes are relatively stable because people are not switching that much. We see that on the off diagonals. Um, and interesting is to compare these results to the model in which I don't uh, categorize response times. Yeah, so that they, they, they said these, these results. And again, you will you will find the Markov model to be the best fitting model, which is that the fast class is like almost all response are in the fast class. Yeah, so you, so this, is, this is really indicative of that, that, that something is, like this is almost on a boundary, this parameter. Yeah, and, and the initial state, uh, the transition parameters are also uh, uh, are different, but not that different. But here you can really tell already that there's, there might be something going on. And that's just because yeah, this, this, this distribution doesn't fit the normal distribution. So you use the, the, the mixtures are used to to account for this misspecification. Yeah, here you have the uh, item parameter estimates. So here for the easiness parameter, uh, for the difficulty, oh, sorry, the easiness parameter, the discrimination parameter, this is the probability correct. And I always have to check if I see these pictures that the gray line here is the fast class. I think in my, in my previous picture, it's the other way around, but here it's the fast class. Gray line is the fast class. So you see that the fast class is more like the, the, the response are easier, like categorized with a, with a higher easiness parameter. Um, they are more, like overall, more discriminative, or like in general range here. And the probability correct is, is just larger. Uh, here again, you really see that I really like these uh, posterior uh, class estimates. Um, these are the raw response times. These are the standardized response times, which could be like some kind of proxy for the residual of the model. Like, as I told, as I begun this whole story about intra-individual intra -individual models, um, I thought that you can also use the inter-individual model and just look at the residuals. 
And this is like a very rough proxy for these residuals. And then still you see that these posterior class properties do add something, like they, they, they show a clearer picture or sometimes a slightly different picture because they take more information into account. Like these residuals are only based on response times. Uh, and these also take the responses into account. Yeah, so you see um, like some, uh, like, like a clearer, you see a clearer figure as compared to the residuals and like for instance, this uh, response, it's, 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 yeah, here you see, uh, here you draw a different conclusion about this response than in this picture. And here as well, like here you also see that this gives another picture than the posterior uh, probability. Then my other solution, this is, this is a different model, so it doesn't rely on categorized response times, but it just um, uses the, um, so this was the initial model, and in this new model I'll present, you, uh, you turn around the uh, regression uh, of the uh, response times. So in the, in the previous model, I, um, I regressed the response times on the latent classes, but here I use the responses to, uh, to identify these latent classes. So what I do, I still have my measurement model for the uh, slow class and my measurement model for the uh, fast class, but um, uh, I, I, I now identify these models by regressing class membership on the standardized response times. So here you see this is the standardized. These are the this is the the, the, the response time residual. Yes, so we have the log response time minus the intercept parameter minus the uh, speed parameter divided by the residual standard deviation. And I have two uh, parameters. So one slow parameter and an intercept parameter. That this is all to identify this fast and this slow uh, class. Or, uh, other way around, sorry, the slow and the fast. Yeah, so the larger the, the standardized response time, the higher the probability of a, a slow response. Yeah, and here you see that, um, that this, this approach, so I'm still cons concerned with this misspecification in the response time. Right? So I'm again assuming here a normal distribution for the response times. But in this model, because the response times are now an independent variable in the, in the identification of these classes, the distribution isn't, uh, misspecification in distribution doesn't uh, result in, uh, in, in big problems anymore. And you can see that from these um, pictures. So here you have no distributional misspecification and assimilated data according to a baseline model. So you see that uh, if you take the difference of the discrimination parameter between the classes and the difference in the easiness parameter between classes, you see that this is, this is kind of around zero as you would expect, because there's nothing going on in the data. Um, and this is if I use a baseline model with overly skewed response times, where I choose the, um, uh, the skewness, the same as my initial simulation, where, uh, where I found these problems with the mixture. Yeah, but you see that there, in that model, it was a big problem. And here you see that, again, I get just like the difference between these uh, the discrimination and the easiness is, is around zero. Yeah, so this, apparently here, this, this humus doesn't matter that much. It doesn't like bias my results. Yeah, so a quick application to a large-scale computerized arithmetic test. Uh, data is also analyzed by, uh, by Winter and uh, Maria Bosinova. Uh, I randomly select 2,000 subjects and 20 items. Um, yeah, that was because I did a simulation uh, study for this model using 2,000 subjects and 20 items. So that just, I wanted the, the application to be a bit similar to the simulation. And here you see very clearly that the, discri that the discrimination in the fast uh, class is larger than the discrimination in the slow class. And that the difficulty, it shows um, like some kind of interesting interaction. Like if you look at the difference between the discrimination in the fast class and slow class, you see clearly that the fast response discriminate better. But here you see this, this, this interaction. You see that for the easier items, so the, sorry, the items are ordered here on um, on difficulty. So you see for the easier items that the uh, fast is more often correct because it's easier. And here you see that the, for the difficult items, the slow is more often correct. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, that, I, I thought that was a nice result. Um, okay, so discussion, I already promised you guys to like 
talk a bit about these two classes. I'm super aware that, that it, 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 it is a pragmatic, like for me it's a pragmatic um, assumption, um, but you can have substantive reasons to, to, to assume two classes or more. Uh, my, my problem with assuming more classes is that yeah, the model gets very complicated, so you really need some constraints, you need some strong theory to identify these classes. And then it's no problem to extend them all in this way. Uh, but I always think that yeah, for pragmatic reasons, like using two, two classes or two states, uh, yeah, it will, in my, from my perspective, it will capture the most important patterns in the data. I don't think that the third class will like, like really capture, like, 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 I'm not afraid that I miss something, or not super afraid that I miss something when you when use two classes. Like statistically, like, I think, I think the, the, the most important patterns in the data. However, with Maria, I worked on um, models for continuous processing. So where you don't use classes to class, but you have a continuous mode of processing, and you can come up with models for those, uh, um, for, for, yeah, for, for, for such, uh, for such individual differences. And then, uh, of course, the categorization, it's also a bit pragmatic, um, but it is effective. Like, yeah, as, as long as we don't have anything better than that, I, I think that we can better categorize response times and fit these mixtures and that we use the continuous response times. But I'm working on uh, like non-parametric approaches, like currently. So non-parametric mixture approaches where you have like no, no, like, no uh, assumption about that. Yes? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention. We have time for questions, discussion. Yes, hi. <coughs> I just wanted to know how it would handle missing data, omitted data, traditionally in IRT, those that don't actually account uh, aren't accounted for in estimation unless you take care of them in some way. So what if you have someone who has a response time but doesn't actually log a response? Yeah, so the, 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 the mixture model, uh, you estimate the mixture model uh, using the EN algorithm, so that accounts for like these missing data. But you just, you, you, can't, you, you integrate these, these missing data out. So it is accounted for. And it's really important to do so because this Markov structure assumes uh, like that your items are like subsequently ordered, right? So for instance, these models don't work for adaptive tests because then for everyone, the item order is different. But here, as long as you use a linear test, everybody's the same order, then you can have missing data in those, in these, in these data. You just have Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, John, thank you. It was really a uh, nice talk and more of a comment than a question. Because I think this is from a practical point of view for, for the assessment of the organization, quite a relevant and important work. To figure out whether while going through it as it needs switch strategy, strategy and then can try to give them feedback on that so that they learn to memorize also four times seven and not uh, Computed every single time. I've a bit of a problem with, with sort of the, the. You're basically saying that your residuals in the log response time model are a mixture of two months. Yeah. And that's a very flexible distribution if one thing is not normal. You can kind of make it like the normal, skew, or more flat. So I'm not sure whether you could really disentangle. Strongly the two sort of processing modes from the shape of the residual. Yeah, no, I, I see your point. Uh, I think the, 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 the power is that you also have the, 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 the responses. So as long as the responses are different, so that the processes are different in their discrimination and their item uh, difficulty, then you don't need this, this distributional assumption to dis disentangle these mixtures. As long as the slow responses are less discriminatory than the fast responses, I think you can disentangle them. But yeah, that's that's work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Are there any questions online? No. 
Uh, I have a small question. Uh, in, on this slide, you mentioned this categorizing continuous response time, and you will use some proportion stake. Are there specific models you are referring, or it's the part you will uh, take afterwards? Well, sorry, the, the robustness check? Uh, yeah, any basic models you will be using for categorizing? Yeah, no, so, I, 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 so what I did in, in the paper is uh, just use two, three, five, seven uh, categories and use different, like, like I use percentiles or equ equidistant uh, thresholds and then look at like model fit initiates, are they giving the same picture and I look at the parameter estimates, are they like comparable and uh, like for the data set that I studied, it was, it was all very robust. So I didn't see like major changes. But I can imagine if you, if you don't have like a large enough sample size that, that, that the results will go all the way between like two categories or five categories. And then I would simply say like that don't trust your results. And uh, yeah, I won't trust my results. And I really want to see the same picture if I do two, three, or four, or five categories. Yeah, it sounds interesting. So uh, it's very uh, informative, and I found very energetic uh, talk on the view of ACT and ACT next. We are thankful to you for making uh, your trip to Iowa City. And uh, there is another part. Uh, our objective of ACT Tech Talk is to develop collaboration and continue discussion. So members here, as well as I see a lot of traffic on the Zoom. There are more than 40 members uh, in the Zoom. Uh, if you have more interest, feel free to contact uh, Dr. Munter Maris, Senior Director of Advanced Psychometric at CTNX, as well as Benjamin, uh, to have, if you have some more connection, collaboration with Darren. So, uh, thanks to all of you here, as well as participants, uh, Zoom participants. As we move with this uh, ACT Talk series, for this year's uh, last talk for 2018, will be by uh, Dr. Krishna Matan. She is the senior director of Heritage and MPCC Research on, and she will present her work on why should you care about MPCC Research, it's our mission on uh, December 5. So we look forward for your uh, presentation, I mean, uh, presence uh, in December 1st day talk. And uh, again, thank uh, to Andrew, uh, Matt, Dave, they are always helpful for it's not one person's work but a lot of coordinations, as well as our uh, ACT next leadership team, who always take this initiative to bring uh, persons like Dalan. Uh, thanks uh, again to Dr. Munter Maris for uh, making these connections uh, and uh, bringing Dalan for this presentation. Thank you all.